So the <coughs> one word that I have for you, uh, this craps, I think you should keep that in mind as the one word that will sum up a secure transaction. And uh, this one word will also let you know where the problem is that you need to be solving in the exam question. So the word CR stands for the creation of the security interest. The first A and the only A in CRAPS stands for attachment. First P stands for perfection and the second P stands for priority. And S stands for sale or settlement foreclosure. So these are also <coughs> the five stages of a secure transaction. The first stage is that you create a security interest. The second is that the security <coughs> interest must attach to the collateral. Third is that the security interest is perfected fourth stage is that the security interests are prioritized, they are ranked, and if the fourth occurs, then S becomes relevant, either you need a sale foreclosure or you need a settlement foreclosure. So I think this one word actually sums up uh, all the stages of a secure transaction. Now the first three stages in fact, the first two stages are absolutely essential. You've got to have a creation of security interest and the security interest must attach. If the security interest attaches, most secure transactions, you may not go further <coughs> because now the security interest is fully enforceable against the debtor. You need perfection in order to compete with other lenders or buyers. And priority matters only if there's competition. And S matters only if there's default. If there's no default and if there's no competition, you still need the first two stages of security transaction. <coughs> there must be a creation of security interest and the security interest must attach to the collateral. So the first two stages, absolutely <coughs> essential. The rest three may or may not occur. <coughs> All right. In order to understand secure transactions, you must understand the classification of collateral. Now, very broadly speaking, you can classify the collateral in three broad terms. Of course, the classical collateral has been goods. And still, goods are, you know, the chief or the most used collateral in secure transactions. The second type is payment rights, and I will explain them further. And the third is whatever doesn't fit into goods or payment rights. For example, a negotiable document, they are neither goods nor payment rights. They represent goods. <coughs> so this is a broad classification. And the classification of collateral is important because, as I will show further, uh, each collateral type may need a different type of perfection. Uh, and therefore, you know, you need to understand uh, the classification <coughs> of collateral. Now, in terms of goods, we subdivide goods into further four categories. The first is inventory, goods are which are for sale or leasing. Then we have consumer goods, goods which are used for household purposes. Then we have farm products. And any goods that don't fit in these three subcategories fall into those purposes. <laughs> and, uh, and I think uh, the subcategories of goods are also important 
because they raise different perception issues. You might also keep this idea in mind that there are three characters, what I call characters, of secure transaction, without which no secure transaction can come into existence. And these three characters are the debtor, the secured party, and the collateral. Two persons and a piece of property. These three characters <coughs> must always, always be present in a secure transaction. You cannot have a secure transaction if any of these three characters is missing. Got to have secured party, got to have a debtor, got to have collateral. Now, security interest <coughs> is the chief concept of secure transaction. If you say what is one of the most important or the most important concept of secure transaction, the answer would be security interest. Because it is the security interest which is created. It is the security interest which is perfected. It is the security interest which is prioritized. Collateral is property subject to security interest. <coughs> security agreement creates security interest. Debtor is the one who creates the security interest in his property. Secured party is someone in whose favor the security interest is created. So you see, all the major characters, they are defined in terms of security interest. And therefore, you know, you've got to have uh, the definition of security interest and the concept of security interest very clear to you. As I've mentioned, the security interest, in my view, is a contingent property right. Contingent property right that is exercisable if default occurs. A secured party has this security interest, which is created in favor of the secured party, but the secured party cannot do anything with this property right unless the debtor defaults. And if the debtor defaults, then this security interest is going to empower the lender, the secured party, to possess the collateral and to sell it to get their money back. But if the debtor never defaults and continues to pay off the loan and the loan is completely paid off, security interest will never be exercised. And at the end of the loan, the security interest will expire and the collateral will become free of security interest. Please note this point, that security interest is created and it also expires. When the loan is completely paid off, the security interest no longer exists. Now, in crafts, the second letter is A, which stands for attachment. Attachment is one of the most important stages of fiscal transaction. And attachment and creation are two different <coughs> things. <coughs> it is possible to create a security interest that never attaches. But what makes the security interest is enforceable is actually the attachment. So the word enforceability and attachment to a large extent are synonymous. If the security interest has attached, it is enforceable. If the security interest is enforceable, it has attached. And please note that the security interest attaches to the collateral. 
It doesn't attach to the security agreement or it doesn't attach to the secured party. So I don't want to hear that the security interest has attached to the security agreement. No. The security interest always and only attaches to the collateral. All right. There are three things that you need in order to make a security interest enforceable. Number one, the lender must give value. The secure party must give value. The value is coming from the secure party. Either to the debtor or to some other person. Number two, the debtors must have rights property rights in the collateral. If you don't have, if the debtor does not have rights in the collateral, attachment is not going to occur. So what about future property? Let's say that you create a security interest in future property that does not exist at the time of the secure transaction. <coughs> Value is given, and the third, you know, condition is also met, but the debtor does not have yet the property that will become the collateral. Of course, attachment is not going to occur. The attachment will occur when the debtor acquires the future property. This point is very important. Normally, the debtor will offer property that he has. But he can also offer property that he will have in the future. Remember there is an after acquired clause in a secure transaction as well. So after acquired property, the security interest will not attach to the after acquired property until the property is acquired. Because one of the conditions of attachment is that the debtor has rights in the collateral. <coughs> the third condition for attachment is either or. Either there should be an authenticated security agreement with the description of the collateral, or you should, can have an oral security agreement with possession of the collateral. Historically, as I mentioned, that common law only recognized possessory secure transactions. And by possessory secure transactions, we mean where the lender has the possession of the collateral. It is only recently that the age of financing, that the credit markets deviated from common law and said you could have a non-possessory secure transaction as well. And now, because of the financing and credit markets, many secure transactions are actually non-possessory secure transactions. So, under possessory secure transactions, description of the collateral was irrelevant because the secure party indeed had the possession of the collateral and there was not going to be any dispute or which collateral, which property was collateralized. But when it is a non-possessory secure transaction, then we need to determine, the parties need to know what exactly is being collateralized. And therefore, description of the collateral becomes a critical element of attachment. You must describe the collateral in the security agreement if it is a non-possessory secure transaction. Now in terms of description, you could be very specific or you could describe the collateral in terms of the definitions of Article 9. But you cannot be super generic. You cannot say all property that I have is the collateral for this scripture. 
But you could say all consumer goods that I have, that is okay. You can say all goods that I have, that is okay. So, Article 9 would allow you generic description, but not super generic description. So you could be very specific, you could be generic, but you cannot be super generic. And when I say generic, that means you can use Article 9 categories and types in order to describe the class. The third stage of a secure transaction is perfection of the security interest. You don't have to perfect if you don't, you know, anticipate any competition from other lenders and buyers. But if you are a secure party and you want to protect yourself against other lenders and buyers and the bankruptcy trustee, you must perfect. And most lenders are going to perfect their security interest. I think perfection is almost a standard practice. Even if you fear no competition, no sale of the collateral, no bankruptcy, you still would perfect to be cautious. There are four methods of perfection. The most important and the one highly recommended by Article 9 is file. Where you file a financing statement in a designated office in the jurisdiction. And by jurisdiction we mean state or a territory. Like Puerto Rico. And you give the most important information to the lenders and buyers. Name of the debtor, name of the secured party, description of the collateral. Now please note that in the financing statement you could be super generic, not in the security agreement. Please do not confuse security agreement with the financing statement. Two different things. The purpose of financing statement is to give notice to lenders and buyers. The purpose of the security agreement is to capture the bargain between the lender and the debtor. Two different things. In the security agreement, collateral must be described according to Article 9, which is that you cannot have super generic descriptions. In the financing statement that you file, with the Secretary of State, you could use super generic description. You could say all property. But make sure that the debtor allows you to do that. Remember, in a financing statement, you are telling the public that the debtor's such and such property has been collateralized. <coughs> has the debtor given you the permission to do so? So the authorization by the debtor is critical for the efficacy of the financing statement. The second method of perfection is of course possession slash control. That the secured party actually possesses the collateral or controls the collateral. The word control refers to collaterals that cannot be possessed, intangible collaterals. Like electronic chattel paper, electronic documents, like investment property. You can control such collaterals, you cannot possess them. Because possession presupposes some sort of tangibility. third method of perfection is automatic, where you don't have to do anything. The secured 
once the security interest attaches to the collateral, the security interest is perfected. No further step needs to be taken. And Article 9 lists the scenarios under which a security interest is perfected upon attachment. Actually, automatic perfection means perfection upon attachment. The fourth method is certificate of title. That there are certain goods which are subject to a title statute, either at the state level or at the federal level or at the international level. There could be a state statute, there could be a federal statute, there could be a treaty. And such goods which are subject to a title statute or a title treaty, their the security interest is perfected by notating the security interest on such bit of title. One thing that I want you to keep very clear in your mind is that filing is a method of perfection, filing is not equal to perfection. Because you can file at any stage of a secure transaction. Article 9 allows creditors to file with the permission of the debtor. Always. Either the permission of the debtor or there is a security agreement. Security agreement is considered as permission by the debtor. So, filing can be done even before a security agreement is made. But perfection can only happen subsequent to attachment. This is the point I want you to keep in mind. Filing can be done any time. Perfection will always, always follow attachment. There can be no perfection of a security interest if the security interest has not attached to the collateral. <coughs> this, this is a very important point. And people confuse this. That just because filing has been done, therefore security interest has been perfected. No. I think you have to ask if the security interest has attached. But if the security interest has attached, perfection will be done, but the priority will be taken from the date of filing. That's the another little twist that a perfection cannot occur without attachment. But once perfection has occurred, then the priority is going to look back at the data file, not at the data perfection. All right. These are the collaterals that can be possessed. And therefore, the security interest can be perfected either by filing or by possession. On the top of the list are goods. Goods can be possessed. And therefore, a security interest in goods can be perfected either by filing or by possession. Then I have tangible documents, and these docu the word document means document of title, like bill of lading or a warehouse receipt which shows that there are goods represented by this piece of paper. If the document is tangible, of course it can be possessed. If it is an electronic document, it can be controlled but not possessed. Then we have certified securities 
again paper security I put the word D because the word delivery is used which is another word for possession but they want to use the word delivery with respect to security and then we have tangible shadow paper now instruments are promissory notes <coughs> which represent a promise to pay money now if you look at the instruments then you could say these are money papers whereas tangible documents are commodity papers and certified securities are investment papers they are all papers the age of paper money paper means represents money documents commodity papers represent some commodity security certified security investment paper represent some investment like stocks and bonds because paper can be possessed therefore you can perfect your security interest by possessing the instruments documents or security now tangible shadow paper is little more complex because it has money payment right plus a security interest and again shadow paper could either be electronic or tangible if it is tangible which means this paper it can be possessed and therefore security interest in tangible shadow paper can be perfected by possession so these are the collateral where you have a choice as a lender either you can perfect by possession or you can perfect by filing a financial statement these three collaterals you have a choice either you file or you control in order to perfect security interest electronic shadow paper of course you cannot possess but you can control and there is a definition of control under article 9 that what would con- be considered as control then we have investment property which is not certificated which is not paper if it is not in a paper form then you can perfect security interest either by filing or by controlling and i think uh, by controlling means you can sell it without debtor's permission that's the definition of controlling investment property if your broker can sell your stock without your additional permission then the broker has control of your investment property so it's the right to sell without additional permission by the debtor and then we have electronic documents again documents of title either file or control p control p means perfection by control or p filing perfection by file now these are the four collaterals where you don't have a choice but do what has been said or what has been recommend what has been mandated in article 9 for example accounts the only method of perfecting security interest in accounts is filing you cannot control accounts you cannot possess accounts and therefore the only method that article 9 gives you to perfect your security interest in accounts is by filing a financial statement 
The word control. You would think, well, why can't you control? You can't. Fixtures. The only method to perfect security interest is fixture filing. Where you file in the county where mortgages are filed because you want to give notice to the mortgage matters. So you won't be able to perfect your security interest in fixtures by possession or control or by filing in the financing, a financing statement in the Secretary of State's office. But then I have a red thing over there. That's TF. Except for trade fixtures. Like, you know, <coughs> removable fixtures, easily removable fixtures. Like your fridge, or television, or this camera. If they are, you know, recognized as trade fixtures in the jurisdiction, then the security interest in trade fixtures can be perfected by filing a UCC1. And then we have money, paper money. If paper money is the collateral, then the only method available for perfection of security interest is possession. No file. Only possession. And then the fourth is deposit accounts. You must control deposit accounts if you want to perfect your security interest in deposit accounts. Filing is not allowed. So see, that these four collaterals, there's only one choice available for perfecting security interests. Automatic, Article 9 gives you a list of situations where the security interest will be perfected upon attachment. The one that we discussed at length is a purchase money security interest in consumer goods. And here is another confusion point. Please do not think that a security interest in all PIMCs is automatically perfected. Wrong. Only a security interest, a purchase money security interest in consumer goods is automatically perfected provided consumer goods are not subject to a certificate of private statute. So first you have to ask two questions. Number one, is it a PMC? Yes. Number two, is the collateral consumer goods not subject to a certificate of title statute? If the answer is yes, automatic perfection. But if it is a consumer good, but subject to a certificate of title, of course you have to notate on the certificate of title. If these are equipment or inventory or Farm products, and you have a PIMC in them, not automatic. Only purchase money security interest in consumer goods. Then we come to the next P of crafts, which is priority. First creation, second attachment, third perfection, fourth priority. In priority, this is the sequence in most cases. In the middle is the lien creditor. Particularly if the lien creditor is the bankruptcy trustee. <coughs> then a perfected security interest ranks higher than the interest of the bankruptcy trustee. And it also stands higher than an unperfected security interest. So perfected security interest rank one. Unperfected security interest rank at the bottom. So an unperfected security interest is going to lose in most cases, if it is competing with either the bankruptcy trustee or with the perfected security interest. 
I might also mention that these are the security interests which are competing with each other. Please don't say that the creditors are competing with each other. It is the security interests which compete. So a perfected security interest beats an unperfected security interest. A perfected security interest beats the lien of a bankruptcy trustee. And in this ranking, temporality does not matter. It doesn't matter who came first. A perfected security interest always beats an unperfected security interest, regardless of time. A bankruptcy trustee is going to always beat an unperfected security interest, regardless of time. So temporality, a non-factor if the competition is between perfected security interest, a lean credit, and an unperfected security interest. However, temporality matters if the security interests belong to the same league. This concept of league is my concept. So be careful not to use it in the bar exam because they might not know what it is. <laughs> so the lead principle simply means that the competing security interests are either all perfected or all non-perfected. If they are all perfected and they are competing with each other, then temporality rule is going to sort them out. If they are all unperfected and competing with each other, again temporality is going to solve the problem. And there you will say, well, which attached first? If they are all perfected, then which security interest was perfected first? If they are all unperfected, which security interest attached first? So temporality is the ranking principle if the competing security interests belong to the same league. Now, <coughs> temporality will solve most of the problem, but then there are special rules of priority depending on the collateral. For example, schedule papers, you have special priority rules, given in 9330. If it is investment property, 9328. If it is deposit accounts, 327. Fixtures, 334. Other collateral, so here's the point that I want you to remember. Ask yourself, is there a special Article 9 section or rule for the collateral under consideration? For example, if you are discussing chattel paper, don't go to the general rules of competition. Yeah. Then you have to go to the special section that deals with chattel paper. You cannot go to 322. This is a general contemporary rule. So this is a common mistake that I see students make in the, in the exams. That they begin to do the competition only under the temporality rule given in 322. Not correct. 322 applies only if there is no specific section available. Remember I've been mentioning this rule that as a general principle in law if there are two rules, one is general and the other is specific, you use the specific rule, it's applicable. The general rule is used only when a specific rule is unavailable. So 
So because 9.330 is a specific rule dealing with shadow papers, you're going to use 3.30 if you're sorting a security interest in shadow papers. And you're not going to go to 9.322, which is the general rule. So this is a, you know, big preparation point that whether the collateral has a specific section in Article 9. For example, purchase money security interest has a special section. If it is a purchase money security interest, then it is exempt from temporality rule. So, if you want to analyze a competition between a purchase money security interest and a non-purchase money security interest, you better find out the section which deals with purchase money security interest. <coughs> but as a general rule, you will find that a perfected PIMSI beats an earlier perfected non pimsy So temporarily PIMSI perfected PIMSI is exempt from temporality rule. <coughs> Please note I'm saying perfected PIMSI. Not all PIMSIs are exempt from temporality rule. Only perfected PIMSI. This is another mistake that is common. That if you find a PIMSI, you say, well, it's, it has priority. Because it's a PIMSI. And priority doesn't matter. Well, it does matter if the PIMSI is not perfected. If the PIMSI is perfected, then it can beat earlier perfected security interests, provided they are non pimsy Now, a security interest may also compete with the rights of a buyer. And in this context, I offered what I call the survivability thesis and then free alienation thesis. Survivability thesis is very simple, that a security interest survives if the collateral is sold. or disposed of. And this is a pro lender rule. Remember Article 9 mm -hmm. wants to protect the credit market. Because the economy is so much dependent on credit, wow. on lenders, that you want to protect lenders. And therefore, Article 9 has been designed to protect lenders, to protect their interests, to protect the credit market. And this rule, that if you sell the collateral, security interest is going to go with the collateral. It's going to survive. It's going to continue. The buyers will be subject to the security interest of the lender. That's the viability. The other competing principle is what I call free alienation. That you want to protect the credit market, of course you do, but you also want to protect the merchandise market. You want to protect the buyers who go and buy things. We don't want to tell them that be careful because you might be subject to some lender's interest. So we have two competing principles <coughs> in a free market based on credit. One is you want to protect credit markets, you want to protect lenders, and number two you want to protect merchandise markets, particularly the buyers. So this tension between the lenders and buyers will have to be sorted out, and Article 9 does that. First of all, it says that if you buy goods from merchants who sell them, 
Don't worry about lenders. You take fear security. So this is a protection of the merchandise market. This rule is protection of the buyers. And it is legislated in 1928, what I call 1928 buyers. So please note that 9320 is only available for goods, not other collateral. Goods only. All types of goods. Consumer goods, inventory, farm products, equipment. All goods. And the buyers are going to take free of security interest if they buy in good faith for value from someone who sells those products, you know, some merchant, even if they know that the goods are subject to a perfected security interest. So this is a clearly pro-buyer rule. Yes. I thought to be a bio cop, you had to have no knowledge that you're violating rights of others. Yes, I think uh, that is different than the knowledge of the uh, perfected security interest. If you are a bio cop, you know that a certain TV in the store has been marked sold, and if you want to buy that one, then you know that something is not right. But ordinarily, if you know that the security interest has been perfected with respect to the goods that you're buying, that knowledge doesn't count. So this 1920 a is the clearest pro-buyer rule and very few restrictions on what the buyer needs to do. Of course, good faith restriction, value restriction, and that you buy from the merchant restriction. Contrast 9320A with 9317B buyers. <coughs> Here, the law is going to protect both lenders and buyers. It's more of a balance. First note that 9317B is not confined to goods. It has goods, but you can buy chattel paper, you can buy tangible documents, you can buy instruments, promissory notes, or you can buy security certificates. And you could still be <coughs> lender under 317B. So 9320A restricted to goods, 9317B broader in scope. But more restrictions. For example, you cannot be a lender whose security interest is perfect. No. Only unperfected security So 317B, a buyer can win or can take free of security interest only if the security interest is unperfected. If it is perfected, no. You are subject to lender's security interest. Number two, knowledge requirement is stricter here as compared to 328. Number three, you must have possession. The buyer must have possession of the collateral. And that's why all the collaterals mentioned in 317B are possessible. We see the internal logic. 317B broader in scope, but all these collaterals which are mentioned in 317B are possessible. <coughs> so when we say shadow paper, obviously we talk about tangible shadow paper. If we are talking about documents, we are talking about tangible documents. Instruments are always paper instruments. That's the definition of instruments. Security certificates, certificated security. So I think uh, when you are analyzing the problem, you will see that 9320A and 9317B have different elements.
Then we have buyers of shadow paper. Again, a very special section on buyers of shadow paper. Article 9 wants to promote a market in shadow papers. Now remember, a shadow paper is produced when you sell goods on credit or leave goods. So a shadow paper is a legal device, is a record whereby goods, only goods, not other collateral, shell paper is from goods only, maybe software. When goods are sold or leased on credit, a shell paper will be produced. But then Article 9 wants to protect a market in shell paper. I mean, there are people who buy and sell shell paper. This is a secondary market. The first market is of goods, where shell paper are produced. Then there is a secondary market of shell paper, where shell paper are bought and sold. And Article 9 wants to protect it. And therefore, there are special rules regarding the buyers of shell paper. First of all, the buyer of shell paper will be considered as engaging in a secure transaction. And they want to protect the buyer against lenders who have lent against security, uh, lent against shell paper. I think there is a bias towards protecting the buyers of shell rather than lenders who lend against shadow paper. And this is what you have to do. If the buyer is a merchant of shadow paper, he gives value in good faith, takes possession or control of the shadow paper, and doesn't have any knowledge, or the shadow paper is not unclean, meaning it's subject, clearly subject to a legend then I think Article 9 is going to say, well, a buyer of a secured, of chattel paper can beat a lender who has already perfected the security interest. So this uh, study of chattel paper, I think the driving principle would be that Article 9 wants to protect a secondary market of chattel paper. And then you ask yourself, what things the buyer must do in order to enjoy the benefits of Article 9. And I think these are the things that are listed. That you buy in good faith, you give value, you take possession or control of the shell paper, and there is nothing <coughs> apparent on the shell paper that it has already been so, sold or something else. The word gather, Article 9 defines the word gather as someone who has rights in the collateral. Then we discuss the situation where companies or corporations or businesses merge or are acquired. And on those situations, Article 9 uses a new terminology called new debtors and original debtors. So please note that even though a person who buys the collateral could be a debtor, if the collateral is still subject to security interest. But a new debtor and original debtor, this terminology, this set, is used only when the original debtor has merged or has been acquired by another debtor. So this merger can take place mostly under the laws of corporation or by contract an original debtor can assign all its rights and obligations to another person. So I think warning over here that the word new debtor and original debtor 
they are used particularly in acquisition and merger situations. So please refrain from using the word new debtor in the case of a buyer, a simple buyer. Article 9 also lists certain purchases as secured transactions. Ordinarily, there is a big difference between a sale and a secured transaction. A sale is not a secured transaction. And a secured transaction may involve a sale. So I think we clarified right up front, before even we started discussing <coughs> Article 9, that distinguish between absolute sale, conditional sale, and a secured transaction. But here we find that even absolute sales are considered as secure transactions. And that's why, you know, we teach you in the law school, no rule is absolute. Always be open for an exception. And don't be frustrated if there are exceptions to be given. So ordinarily, an absolute sale is not going to be a secure transaction except when the collaterals are these. <coughs> An absolute sale of shell paper, secure transaction. An absolute sale of accounts, secure transaction. An absolute sale of payment intangibles, a secure transaction. <coughs> An absolute sale of promissory note, secure transaction. And the buyers are going to be secured parties and sellers are going to be debtors. <coughs> and the thing sold is going to be the collateral. And there are special rules. Article 9 has special rules on the sale of these 1, 2, 3, 4 <coughs> collateral. Accounts, payment intangibles, promissory notes, these are all payment rights. And even a shell paper has a payment right in it, even though it is payment right plus the security interest. So you will find that Article 9 considers these sales as secure transactions. You say, why? Why does it say that? The purpose is to sort out the ranking if the seller sells the same thing twice. Ordinarily, once you sell it something, you can't sell it again. That's the law of property. That once you sell your TV, you can't sell it again. Because it'll be fraud. And the second buyer is going to get nothing. Not under Article 9. <coughs> You can sell accounts and you can sell them again. Unlawful. But that's what the buyer has to sell. See the distinction. The seller can do it. So we keep that property principle still intact. A seller, you can do it twice. <coughs> but then we turn around and say, okay, as far as the buyers are concerned, we're going to have a different rule. If a buyer bought an account, accounts or shell paper, and then a second buyer bought the same account of shell paper, well, both are competing with each other. One is saying it's mine, the other is saying it's mine. How do we sort out this competition? One is to use the property principle and simply say the first buyer gets it. But we don't do that. We have a more complex rule. We say, well, if the whoever perfected first is going to have priority. So if buyer number one doesn't perfect and buyer number two buys the same account and perfects, buyer two is going to win over buyer one. So what is the message of Article 9? The message of Article 9 is to the buyers if you buy it, one of these four things, 
you better perfect your security insurance. <coughs> Give notice right away. Maybe even before you buy it. Give notice so that another buyer won't buy the same stuff again. So that's, you know, that's what we are doing in Article 9. That if you want to buy shell paper, if you want to buy accounts, payment intangibles, or promissory notes, five. Give notice and you are protected. But if you don't file, you don't give notice, even though your first buyer, you might lose to the second buyer. Because the second buyer didn't know that the sales transaction has already been completed. So we, you know, somewhat play games with the traditional property principles. Proceeds. The collateral can be sold even if there's a, covenant, a, a contract restriction. When you enter into a security transaction as a lender, you can put a covenant in the security agreement saying that the debtor will not sell the collateral. And state of Kansas, for example, would uphold this covenant. In fact, there is a criminal sanction for the violation of such a covenant in Canada and maybe in other jurisdictions. So if you are a debtor and you entered into a secure transaction and the lender prohibited the sale of the collateral and you sold it, you might face criminal charges. But that doesn't mean the buyer doesn't have the right. Again, we have a split that the debtor is prohibited, of course the debtor is prohibited by contract, but the buyer can still buy it. And we're going to protect the buyers in some situations. So proceeds are generated when the collateral is sold. But that's very narrow definition. Again, the definition of proceeds is very broad because you want to protect the credit markets. You want to protect the lenders. So if the collateral has been sold, then you want to give something to the lender to get their money back if the fault occurs. So in a very generous way, Article 9 defines proceeds as whatever is generated by the disposition of the collateral. In fact, disposition is not necessary to produce proceeds. The proceeds could be generated even otherwise, without disposition of the collateral. For example, the collateral is destroyed instead of sold. But the debtor gets insurance money for that. Insurance funds are proceeds of the collateral. So this position is not essential for the generation of proceeds. Very broad concept. Whatever you know you get by the collateral there might be some judicial restrictions how far you can go with the concept of proceeds. But it's very generous. I think the bias is towards counting something as proceeds than not. Article 9 defines uh, device proceeds into two broad categories. Cash and non-cash. Now cash proceeds are defined as money, checks and deposit accounts. If you sell the collateral and you get actual cash, that's cash. But if you get a check of $50,000, that is also cash. If someone transfers $50,000 in your deposit account, that is also cash proceeds. 
So electronic transfer of funds, a physical check, electronic check, or Federal Reserve notes, cash. These are cash proceeds. Whatever is not cash is called non-cash proceeds. So non-cash proceeds is a default category. It's not defined. Whatever, if you can't fit in cash proceeds, but it's a proceed, then it will fall into non-cash proceeds. But I've listed certain things for you. For example, if you sell the red car and get the blue car, then the blue car is the proceeds of the red car. So any goods that you get in exchange of the collateral will be proceeds. Number two, you sell the collateral and an account is created. For example, the electric company sells electricity and an account is created. See, we all have accounts with the phone companies, we have accounts with utility companies, we have phone with internet companies, etc., etc. For them, this is cash flow. This is property. And they can use accounts in order to get loans from the bank. So, when you sell collateral, if electricity was the collateral, if water was the collateral, then by selling that collateral, you might create an account. That account is proceeds of the collateral. Similarly, you sell collateral and get a promissory note. A promissory note is not a cash proceed, but it's a non-cash proceed. Similarly, you might sell the collateral and get a channel paper. So channel paper could also be proceeds by selling or leasing the collateral. Because note that channel paper is produced both by selling and leasing goods. Leasing goods can also produce shelter. This is another pro lender rule. That if you have if the security interest has a pass in the original collection and the original collateral is sold, there's automatic attachment of security interest into the proceeds. So the lender doesn't have to worry. If the security interest was attached to the original collateral, it will be considered attached to the proceeds. Automatic attachment. Nothing further needs to be done. Very pro lender rule. That if the collateral is sold and the security interest, first of all, goes with the collateral, second, you have a second security interest, and that is in the process. So actually, this position might be good for a lender. Because now lender has two security interests. One in the original collateral and the second in the proceeds. And if by some reason under law the security interest in the original collateral has disappeared, well, they still have a security interest in the proceeds. And the attachment will be automatic. Number two, even perfection is going to be automatic if the security interest in the original collateral was perfected. If the security interest in the original collateral was not perfected, of course there's going to be no perfection in person. But if the security interest in the original collateral was perfected, then the perfection in the, of the security interest in proceeds is automatic. So you get two automatic benefits. You have automatic attachment in the proceeds and you have automatic perfection in the proceeds. 
third benefit, the continuation of perfection. There we have two rules. If you have cash proceeds, indefinite continuation. If these are non-cash proceeds, you have 20 days to watch out. For 20 days, your automatic perfection is going to continue. On the 21st day, it might become unperfect. So you have 20 days to figure out if you need to be perfect. So see these three rules. Automatic attachment of security interest in proceeds. Automatic perfection of security interest in proceeds. And continuation of perfection of security interest in proceeds. Either indefinitely or permanently. Indefinitely if this check or money or bank account. And 20 days if it is something else. Now, as I said, you know, you have two security interests when the collateral is disposed of. One in the original collateral and the second in the proceeds. I think the question is, if the debtor defaults, do you have to go against the original collateral or do you go against the proceeds? whichever is convenient to the lender. If it is convenient for the lender to go after the proceeds, so be it. If it is convenient for the lender to go after the original collateral, so be it. Of course, you cannot have two remedies. You just want to get your money back. You don't want to get your money back twice. You want to get your money back once. Yes. If you're dealing with competition for priority, say, um, when does the ranking begin? With the section of the original yes. uh, collateral? Yes. The question is that if the default occurs after the collateral has been sold, how do we rank the security interest in proceeds? And the answer is that the original ranking in the original collateral will be transferred to the proceeds. Same, same rank. Uh, any other questions here that you might have? Okay. Now, two security interests, one remedy. Here I want to make a distinction between non-recourse and fully recourse secure transactions. In a non-recourse secure transaction, the lender is confined to the collateral. The lender cannot go after the other assets of the debt. In a fully recourse loan, the lender first go after the collateral, get their money as much as they can. And if there's still some outstanding debt, then they get a money judgment against the debtor. Remember, the whole purpose of secure transaction is to avoid going to the court and getting a money judgment. Because ordinarily, if the debtor doesn't pay your loan and you are an unsecured creditor, you're going to go to the court and say, you know, he owed me money, he is not paying me. Uh, I did a money judgment and then you get a money judgment and then you get some, you know, <coughs> execution orders against some property of the debtor, long judicial process. Secure transaction cuts it off and says, you know, identify your collateral <coughs> against which you're going to give your loan and if the debtor defaults, you can simply go get that collateral, sell it in a commercially reasonable manner and get your money back. No need to go to the court. It is all up to you to settle, to sell, to renegotiate, 
the solution with the debtor. Don't have to go to the court. So that is the advantage, benefit of secure transactions. Um, <clears throat> let me explain a couple of more things since we do have time. Uh, the law of filing. Now, filing is a method of perfection. And it's a preferred method of perfection. It is a method that most secure bodies use. Particularly in financing situations where possession or control is not possible. In the case of law of filing, the most important thing that you need to understand is the changes that occur after you have filed. Post-filing events. For example, first of all, Article 9 simplifies filing by saying you file where the debtor is located. It used to be a much more complex rule. Now, even though the collateral is scattered all over the U.S., if you haul takes a loan, I mean, their properties are scattered all over the United States. But where is you haul is headquartered? Where is it located as a company? That's where you find. So Article 9 has simplified the flow of filing that you file where the debtor is located. Now, what if the debtor relocates? We also learned that the name of the debtor is the most important piece of information in the filing records, UCC1. If you don't have the name right, your financing statement is going to be ineffective and your security interest is not going to be perfected. Please note that your security interest is not going to be perfected if the financing statement is ineffective. <coughs> and how do you make an ineffective financing statement? The most important thing that you get the debtor's name right. You don't want to use debtor's nickname. You don't want to use debtor's trade name. You don't want to use debtor's popular name. You don't want to guess debtor's name. This is where you want to spend resources in order to find if the debtor's name is indeed the legal name in the papers. Particularly if it is a company, it's going to be easy. If it is an individual, it's going to be difficult. Because individuals can change their names, you know, much more rapidly. And common law allows people to change their names if they have no intention of frauding the creditors. So the name of the debtor is most important in the filing records. So two main things that will occur. One is that the debtor is going to relocate. Number two, the debtor is going to change the name. In these two situations, Article 9 gives four months to the creditors, to the lenders, to the secured parties to refile under the correct name and in the correct jurisdiction. If the debtor was in Kansas and moved to Missouri, within four months you should refile in Missouri. If the debtor was John Smith and now has become John Doe, you should refile under John Doe now within four months. The third situation is where the debtor has merged with another debtor. And a new debtor has come into being. Again, we have four months over there. So please note that post-filing events, your filing was perfect and your security interest was perfected. But because the debtor has relocated or because the debtor has changed the name, what is going to happen to your security interest is going to be unprotected if you don't take care of it. Alright, I think uh, 
if there's any question on this, uh, I can, you know, if there's any question I'm fighting or otherwise. Um, that's it for today. On Thursday, I'm going to give you uh, some of the insights into exam taking, uh, both here and in the bar. So please come on Thursday, and well, it's a short class relatively. We have to do student evaluation first, and then we will. Yeah. Okay. What day would you give us our exam final? Our exam final will be uploaded. It's not going to be physical delivery. It will be uploaded on the website uh, on the first day of the exam, which is Monday, I think. Yeah. The first day of the exam is Monday. Sorry? Uh, it will be due next Monday, seven days.